Hello and welcome back to part two of our Spy Master interview series, celebrating our one year anniversary and the 23rd anniversary of this week's film, 1998's The Avengers. And Cam, we foreshadowed it in the last episode where we spoke to the director of the film, Jeremiah Chechik, and I recommend anyone pops back and listens to that one if you haven't listened to it already. But who do we have joining us this week? Yes, we are talking to Don McPherson, the screenwriter of the 1998 Avengers film. He has the sole screenplay credit on that film. It's going to be a really interesting journey, I think, into how he wound up, um, you know, a fairly new writer with the sole credit on this film, this major summer blockbuster. And was it supposed to be a blockbuster? So many questions to dive into. And I think Don is more than willing to give the answers to those burning questions. So hop in the Bentley with us as we go for a ride and learn about the story behind the story of 1998's Avengers with the writer, Don McPherson. Cam, roll that clip. And joining us today, the writer of the film this week, which is The Avengers from 1998, we are joined by Don McPherson. Don, thank you for joining us. Hi, it's great to be here. I see you're enjoying a glass of wine. That's a, that's a good start for uh, a <laughs> yeah, chat six, about uh, Avengers. It's six o'clock here. It's ah, not yes. time, but it is uh, wine o'clock. So. <laughs> I wish I could say the same, but I'm just on water currently. Okay. So um, one thing we, when we talk to people before we get into the particular film that we're covering of the week, we'd like to get a little bit of information on their background. So the first question we generally ask is, how did you get started in, in your case in screenwriting? Uh, in my case, I was uh, a film critic uh, for Time Out magazine, which at one point was considered uh, quite a big deal. So I was about 24, 25. Um, but uh, in reality, I'd been movie crazy for all through my teens and uh, beyond. And um, when I was about 18, I hitchhiked down to the Cannes Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And um, to cut a long story short, I got to know very well the uh, kids of uh, an American screenwriter, Ben Barsman, who lived in Cannes and was one of the screenwriters to be thrown out of Hollywood during the McCarthy hearings. He'd worked with Joseph Losey and then worked with Anthony Mann and people in Europe. Um, and uh, he was, you know, I was movie crazy, but Ben was the first real screenwriter I'd ever met um, because you you don't really see them. And... Um, uh, luckily for me, I knew a lot of the films he'd worked on, so I could chat with him. Uh, I thought he was fantastic. And then when uh, he and his kids went back to L.A., uh, by then I was big friends with their family, uh, I went out to L.A. and um, became friends with a lot of their kids and their generation of friends who'd been blacklisted, basically. Mm. So I knew that about, you know, this strange creature called a screenwriter. But then in my own um, uh, work over here, I was a journalist and a film critic. I found a book called Absolute Beginners, which I pressed upon uh, a friend who was a director, Julian Temple, and another friend, Stephen Woolley, who was becoming a producer. And we ended up working on a film uh, of that, which took a long, long while. And uh, I worked on the music and on the script of that. And then after that, I, um, uh, I had to make a choice and leap into this world of screenwriting on my own. So I decided to do that. I got a, um, uh, some films made at the BBC. I did a film uh, of a Sheridan Le Fanu novel called Uncle Silas with Pedro Toole and Jane Lapiterre. And uh, strangely, the director, Peter Hammond, uh, had actually directed some of the early uh, TV episodes of the Avengers um, mm -hmm. by a, a strange uh, thing. Um, anyway, I went on like that and um, uh, I started doing my own screenplays and got reasonably successful like that. And then um, one thing led to another, but I can, I can tell you <laughs> how they <laughs> led from one thing to another. So basically I was uh, nuts about movies um, uh, Hollywood movies, French movies, all sorts of movies, all through my teens. And um, I wrote about them. I watched them. I would see like 30 movies a week, you know. And um, uh, it was uh, my entire life. So I uh, 
st only stopped watching a ton of movies when I became a screenwriter, but I had uh, mm. basically a, a kind of a memory of uh, so many movies in my head. And uh, uh, I also had a love of uh, comic strips from when mm. I was young. Uh, so everything that your mum and dad would tell you about having a wasted use, I, um, uh, you know, about um, uh, comic books, TV and films, I managed to um, spend a lot of time doing and then that's ended up being what I uh, could do because I loved it, you know. Well, it seems like someone who has such a background in pop culture in this era and sort of comic book style seems perfectly suited to be adapting the Avengers, but the um, sort of the background leading into actually getting the job seems like a bit of a leap. How did you actually go about getting towards actually being attached to this, pro to this property? Well, um, I had written a script called Jonathan Wild, uh, which had received a lot of attention. It got voted um, uh, <laughs> among the best unmade scripts in Hollywood in a certain year. Uh, the two other ones were uh, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind by um, Charlie Kaufman and um, I think it was Kafka by Lem Dobbs, which I think got made by Steven Soderbergh. And there was my Jonathan Wilde. Um, and uh, Jodie Foster uh, bought that and was on board. Neil Jordan was wanting to direct it after The Crying Game. And because of that, this rather eccentric, uh, violent, very British, um, very cinematic <laughs> script that I'd written um, uh, went past all the sort of development people and uh, producers, heads of studios had to read what Neil Jordan wanted to do next. And bless him, it, it turned out to be this. Um, so a lot of people read this and um, I started getting, uh, I won't say offers from Hollywood, but I got an offer and uh, uh, went over and um, I started working at Warner Brothers and I, I can tell you what I did there but um, uh, I, well, I, I, at Warner Brothers I the first script I got offered was The Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens and I oh, did wow. a script with this and um, uh, I, someone my agent called me up one lunchtime and, and said you've won the Terry Gilliam lottery and I said, what's the Terry Gilliam lottery? And they said, he reads all the scripts from CAA, which is one of the big agencies in LA that I was with and that Terry was with. And out of all this pile of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things, and he hates them all, he likes your script and no one could work out why. It turned out uh, I was living in Highgate in London. Uh, and he was living, I was living down the hill. He was living up the hill. <laughs> So I ended up working for about a year with Terry on that um, uh, film. Uh, it was for Mel Gibson. That didn't get made. Uh, I'd worked on another script, uh, Frankenstein, which was for uh, a great combo of Arnie Schwarzenegger and Tim Burton. Perfect. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, Arnie didn't want to do it. He thought it was too highbrow. Um, uh, so that was that. Um, and then uh, uh, basically I'd done these two scripts which had gone very well at Warner's and to, to get, you know, scripts to that level of being enjoyed and liked, whatever. Um, there was this other guy um, on the other side of the lot, uh, Jerry Weintraub. Uh, the female producer I'd done these scripts for was a very esteemed, a fantastic female producer, Paula Weinstein. And Jerry was, um, maybe he was the next office on the lot. But anyway, Paula and Jerry were complete um, opposites. Paula was female, left-wing, radical, former communist. Uh, I'd done all those um, uh, scripts for her. She had, in fact, known this guy, Ben Barsman, that I met in, um, uh, in France. Um, Jerry was a, you know, a Republican uh, ex, you know, music manager. He managed uh, Frank Sinatra and Elvis and, you know, uh, uh, big connections in Las Vegas, all these kinds of things. Anyway, Jerry loved the Avengers. And Jerry had a big library of about 500 or 1,000 titles, you know, properties. And uh, the thing he most wanted to make was the Avengers. He just loved this crazy English stuff. 
They've been trying to do it for a while. Um, and uh, one of the, his story editor, a guy called Matt Leipzig, had read my script to Jonathan Weil. Uh, and he wrote a kind of a love letter about it, you know, because um, uh, it was crazy and violent and just unlike all the other scripts <laughs> there. <laughs> um, and he put me up for this and Jerry uh, said, well, let's have a meeting. And um, it turned out that uh, a guy called Sam Hamm had done a script. He did the, I want to think the first version of the Batman movie. Um, that hadn't worked out. It was very difficult. And really, they were still arguing just about the concept. How would you do the Avengers? How could you do the Avengers? It seemed, you know, it was, an, it was a property. Uh, and I think it was maybe just before the kind of craze of adapting TV things for movies. Um, I and mean, now everything gets done, you know, Man from Uncle, Charlie's Angels, everything. But this was slightly before that. But um, they couldn't figure out what to do. Should it be on, set on Concord, you know, between London and America? Should it be, should it turn them into American? I mean, they just couldn't figure out a, a way of doing it. Um, so I, with the confidence of youth and the brashness of someone, and I have to say uh, the arrogance, I said, well, it's about Mrs. Peel and it's set in Avengers land. It's an, an entirely self-referential self world. Uh, that's where it's set. And um, that's where all the action takes place. Um, and uh, to my amazement, they, uh, they bought this. They thought this was a fantastic idea. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, I hadn't, needless to say, thought of a, um, a story yet, but um, I was very clear on certain things about the TV show, which I had loved as a kid growing up in, uh, uh, in England. And I was very clear about what you could or couldn't do as a movie. Um, I'm happy to go into that phase, uh, if you like. Um, should I, yeah, should I go into them? Well, I, I, I mean, the next question would be in that realm. My next question lined up was, what was your connection to the original Avengers show, which you said you yeah. have enjoyed. I, I, I love it, like, like all kids. Uh, I was brought up in Nottingham. You know, um, I watched the TV avidly. Uh, I watched Danger Man, uh, The Avengers, The Prisoner, um, everything. I, I, I watched everything, it has to be said. But uh, The Avengers, like everyone, uh, it was my favorite. Uh, I watched the first series. I didn't watch the later series. In fact, I didn't much like those. But like every um, teenager who'd ever seen uh, Patrick McNee and Diana Rick, uh, it was just fantastic. It was funny, witty, a little bit scary, a little bit trippy, um, quite dark, quite light, a whole new, absolutely unique mix of very British, very English um, things. Um, uh, well Sorry, yeah, go on. No, I was just going to ask then, before you get into how you got around adapting it, were yeah. you at all hesitant to take up this franchise that you obviously cared about as a young man uh, when you were watching it in Nottingham? It, it's a big responsibility and it's your, it, potentially your first big Hollywood film. That's a lot on your plate for the first project. Did, was there any hesitance or were you just like, ah, let's just do it? Uh I can remember my mindset. Uh, I, you know, I, I hesitate to say uh, it was the brashness of youth, mm. but, or I hesitate to say the arrogance of youth, but it was definitely the brashness of youth. Um, I had no hesitation at all. Um, the, I, I had had some connection uh, in a strange way uh, through the designer Anton First through to uh, Batman and how they'd made that. And I'd seen the script that they'd made of Batman. And um, with my love of comic books, um, it was obviously apparent that they had made the first Batman entirely from the sort of Frank Miller, um, uh, you know, reimagining of um, Batman, the, the Dark Knight. Mm -hmm. uh, and they'd made, they turned Batman from a uh, rather, um, how can I say, uh, uh, sort of white bread kind of comic into this dark, epic, scary world of Gotham City and um, 
the Joker and the Penguin and everyone uh, that we know that. But what they've done in Batman, uh, the cartoon characters, like in the 60s TV show, were entirely comic book uh, cartoons. They had no depth at all. What they've done was, uh, which is very clever for Batman, uh, was they said, uh, how did Batman become Batman? How did Bruce Wayne become Batman? The answer in the Frank Miller books is that the world that he makes, that he draws, that he inks, that he illustrates, is really a reflection of Bruce Wayne's trauma at seeing his parents being killed. That's the thing that colors uh, and darkens every um, action that Batman does. And so he's not even a, um, uh, necessarily a, uh, a good hero. He can be quite mixed. He can be light and dark. Uh, so he's very um, uh, ambiguous and ambivalent. Um, and it seemed to me that that darkness and that sort of trauma, um, if you like, uh, that was so successful in the first Batman thing, I began to think that that was really the way you could do the Avengers. Um, I thought that the TV uh, series should remain as it is. That That's there for anyone who wants to go to it. But for a big Hollywood movie, uh, I thought uh, the first thing I thought was that no one will understand the British situation, um, the world of the Avengers as such. It's too dense and too English. You have to have some goal or some sort of quest in a film story that's worth doing a movie out of. Um, so uh, I can remember when I was uh, obviously being asked the $64 question, well, what is it about? My reasoning was that in the series, the attraction really is Mrs. Peel, especially the Diana Rigg, Mrs. Peel. Who is she? Where is she from? You never know. You never find out. And you never actually find out why she is Mrs. Peel. Mm -hmm. You do see Peter Peel uh, in one episode, but it's never really referred to. There is a lot of sexual tension between Steed and Emma Peel, but nothing, not a romance or anything. So I had, uh, <laughs> to my own mind, a terrific idea, which was I was going to do a really dark story of a black widow, Emma Peel, and a revenge movie about who killed her husband, Peter Peel. Hmm. So the movie was going to be, and the first script was, who killed Peter Peel, uh, Emma's husband. Emma has been traumatized and has been away from uh, the, uh, the world of science and of uh, the secret services. Uh, but uh, footage has emerged of a uh, someone who appears to be her laying waste to a top secret facility uh, in England. And so the story was going to be uh, to Steed. Um, we want you, we want Emma Peel to come and answer questions about who's been doing this thing. We have pictures of her. She claims it's not her. We want you, Steve, to find out what's going on here and if Emma Peel is guilty or not. If she uh, isn't guilty, we want to know what's happening because to our minds, she seems crazy. Mm. But if she is guilty, Steve, we want you to kill her. So that was basically the story, which is um, a widow returns to the fray, accused of crimes against the state, and has to uh, find out her innocence, declare her innocence, has to fight to prove her innocence. If she's not innocent, Steed will kill her. So uh, what it was going to be, and what the first script was about, was uh, Emma Steed tracking down these, uh, through these strange events that have been happening, uh, trying to unravel uh, the mystery of uh, how her husband had been killed, who had killed him and uh, why this um, uh, these current strange events seem to be trying to drive her mad. Right. Yeah. So, okay, now this is really interesting because at this point in time, are they still looking at the Avengers as being 
like a summer blockbuster? Or at this point, like, are you thinking of it more as more of a, you know, mid-tier budget sort of um, kind of esoteric adventure film? Uh, It was absolutely not a summer blockbuster. If it was, uh, I wouldn't have been writing it for a start. Uh, The way I pitched it to them and which they understood it as was as a, let's say, a, uh, a kind of a French movie. <laughs> right. Um, uh, at that time, Warner's had a lot of big, you know, uh, mass audience hits. They had Lethal Weapon, they had Dirty Harry, they had Batman, they had even had JFK. In the records division, there was Prince and Madonna, you know. This is a pretty good lineup, you know. And certain people in the company wanted to extend their reach. Let's do something. We're Warner Brothers. We can do anything. Let's do something pretty crazy, but pretty high art, high end. Let's do it. So let's see where it's going. Um, and uh, if we can make Batman work, maybe we can do other things. So when I did the uh, screenplay, the first director they went to was Jean-Jacques Binnix who did Diva. And that was a good fit, I thought. That was very good. Uh, I think there were some ructions between them in the studio. It didn't work out. The next person was David Fincher, hmm. who I'd worked with on Alien 3. Um, I was, did rewrites for him up at Pinewood while they were uh, shooting the movie. I'd have gone on well with him. He loved the, the script. Um, And we went to see him on the set of Seven. Uh, During a scene they were filming with Morgan Freeman and Gwyneth Paltrow. Uh, He really loved the script, wanted to do it. Um, uh, You know, a footnote is that Seven uh, was the first movie he'd done since Alien 3 because he'd really been blackballed. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. They didn't like him on Alien 3. And uh, when I was working with him, I... I said to him, man, um, they were just trying to fire him, do anything to get him to stop. Uh, And I said, oh, man, I just surprised you don't have a heart attack. Uh, And he said memorably, um, uh, I don't get a heart attack. I give heart attacks. But Fincher (laughs) was uh, certainly like my uh, choice. Fincher was fantastic and had the the balls and the guts and the take no prisoners attitude. And in fact, um, he did a, a commercial for a Honda car uh, using bits of the script. Uh, I can send you that. But it's a very funny uh, Avengers uh, episode, you know, so, you know, a half minute um, commercial. Um, but uh, Fincher wanted to do it in black and white, of course, uh, being Fincher. And the studio said, no, 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 no. <laughs> you're absolute trouble, Fincher, and you cost $3 million, and you're not going to take a blind bit of notice of what we say. Anyway, so they said no. Um, and, of course, that was before Seven was a hit. And even on the set of Seven, I thought, I thought David was fantastic, but I thought, oh, my God, he's doing it again, this incredibly slow, lugubrious, dark so shit where nothing happens. I thought, oh my God, David, you're like, yeah, you're gonna do it again. But anyway, Seven was a huge hit. So then they would have been pleading for him to do it. Um, after David Fincher, they went to Alex Proyas, who had done The Crow, mm-hmm. again, which is all very dark, um, fantastic film. Uh, Alex uh, agreed to do it, but then he got the money to do a film of his called Dark City from his own, um, so he went off. Um, Good film. Then we got um, um, uh, a fantastic guy, Nick Mayer, Nicholas Mayer, who yeah. had done the Sherlock Holmes movie, Seven Percent Solution, had done Star Trek movies, done a lot of stuff. Um, he loved the script, and um, I spent a time with him working on it, and um, uh, he loved the whole thing, and. Uh, he had some personal issues at that time. The film got delayed. You know, he, he, he ran out of steam and just said, I, I can't um, commit to this. Um, Mike Newell <laughs> was uh, interested. And uh, he said to me, the thing is, Don, it's about a woman in mourning, isn't it? And I said, well, 
yes, but don't tell the studio that because they're, <laughs> you know, not um, uh, really going to green light that. Um, so he, he got it. Um, but after this array of people, and this is by no means uncommon, obviously, in, in uh, LA and Hollywood, they have a, a property, they have a, you know, a script that people like that's adventurous, let's say, that's dark and uh, uh, has a lot of uh, action stuff in it. Uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, Jeremiah arrived. Uh, Jeremiah had, uh, was a really, really smart, more useful kind of director who had uh, been a very successful uh, fashion photographer, commercials director, very, very savvy, loved the material, and seemed to provide a, uh, a sort of a, um, uh, how can you say, a passport between the kind of um, hard-edged French art movie and the more commercially-minded movie that obviously they would like to have. So mm -hmm. Jeremiah seemed to satisfy both ends of the spectrum. And um, uh, when I worked with Jeremiah, you know, I'd gone with Jeremiah very, very well. Um, he really liked the script um, and um, off we went. Uh, he cast uh, Ray Fiennes and Uma Thurman and Sean Connery. And I thought, well, that's pretty good, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, just to say that the thing then was that um, this was a very dark movie, a very... Um, uh, you know, a revenge movie, basically. And the, uh, I don't know if you've got a, um, a series of clips that I was sending you, but my influences in the, for the script were the films by Mario Bava, Italian mm -hmm. director, um, a sort of horror um, and uh, suspense uh, director, uh, Dario Argento, uh, sorry, Dario Argento, who did Suspiria, Mm -hmm. um, and Mario Bava did a great film, uh, Danger Diabolique, which was a kind of a sexy spy spoof, I think they call it. But it was very surreal, very cerebral. And there's a French director, uh, Georges Frangy, who did a film called Judex, uh, which has some terrific sequences, uh, really, really beautiful things. So these were my influences, and these were you know, what I'd, let's say, uh, paying homage to in the script. <laughs> Um, uh, and uh, unfortunately, one big thing that happened was uh, since it was all around who killed Mr. Peel and Emma goes on a uh, crazed revenge mission to find the murderer, uh, one of the first suggestions from Warners and everybody was when we started getting into serious discussions was to do without the Mr. Peel plot. Right. So this is, <laughs> well, this is where it starts to get interesting in terms of the story, because we spoke yeah. to Jeremiah Chechik a couple of weeks ago. All right. uh, so we, we, we spoke to him about the film as well. And charting the course of the film, it starts off as this uh, as the script you're describing with a revenge plot, quite dark, quite, quite brooding by the sounds of it in its own way. And yeah. then you're, you're courting people like David Fincher. Yes. And then you move on to Jeremiah Chechik, you know, director of National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Different sort of film, different kind of director. Was the script evolving along with this change or was it still your script and they were courting different directors at the time? Well, this is where the story does get interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I have no bones to pick with Jeremiah because uh, he was terrific. He works super hard on this. He's bright, he's smart, he's super, super talented. Mm -hmm. And he's really been uh, badly treated by both the press and the studio on this film. So my heart goes out to him and he really fought for the film he was trying to make. Uh, and um, as I say, if you uh, did a film and then cut 50 minutes out of it, it wouldn't be surprising if there are some gaps. Um, yeah, but shocking. Yes, uh, so um, it's, fair, but it's fair to say that uh, there was a sort of transition uh, going on. Uh, when they say um, evolving, uh, uh, at that time, after Nick Mayer uh, got involved, but then he pulled out, um, they realized they couldn't film it in the summer of whatever year it was. Uh, it must have been 96 or something. So they put it back, I think, to 97. Mm. Um, and they're trying to find a director and found Jeremiah. So, um, but in that gap, what, what I didn't realize, I was completely isolated in London. I would go over and work on the script and have meetings and so forth. But um, 
you know, you'd hand in your uh, script um, and uh, it comes back with a thing saying, you know, copyright Warner Brothers. That's part of the deal. You know, you, it's not your script, it's Warner Brothers. They've paid for it, a property for Warner Brothers. Um, you know, obviously that, that screenwriter is very well of that. What I hadn't realized was that when it says property of Warner Brothers, that's very much what they mean. It is ours, theirs, and we can do what we want with it. Uh, one of which things, to my amazement, was that they started to put bits from my script into other movies. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's a Batman film, I think it's Batman and Robin or uh, something like that. Uh, um, anyway, everyone read this script because um, it was, you know, people loved the script. It was dark, it was wild, it was crazy, and, uh, and it moved like blazes. You know, it was pretty good, even though I say so myself. Um, uh, you know, um, but they took stuff out and put them in Batman films. There were a couple of sequences that. They put in a couple of the Batman films. They're, they were developing at one of the other companies on the Warner Brothers lot, they were developing The Matrix. And if you've ever seen The Matrix, which I'm sure you will have, you oh, will yeah. see the Carrie Ann Moss character is up on a rooftop in a leather suit for some reason, you know, evading uh, you know, the cops or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and years later when I saw it, oh, I said, I wrote that, you know. Um, so they'd just taken something from the Avengers script and put it in the Matrix script. You know, I have no idea why Carrie Ann Moss is in a leather suit. I don't know, you know, but there she is. Um, so they'd taken a, like an Emma Peel episode and put it in there. And then I think one of the Batman and Robin things, there's a, there's a kiss between doubles, um, uh, two females in a, a maze or something. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I think. Are you talking about maybe the um, the um, poison ivy Batgirl stuff? Perhaps. Yes, yes. yes. Which Uma played. Mm. And that was, that was a sequence I'd written for the Avengers. Uh, there was another sequence in one of the Batman films, like another fight thing. I think. And uh, I, I didn't see any of these films until much, much later. But as we would go through the, the process, as they say, the evolution, <laughs> uh, you'd get these strange requests, you know, which is, um, uh, it, it appears to me that they, Warner's had a problem, basically, that they were doing the Matrix and the Avengers. And basically, yeah, the Avengers was Matrixy. Uh, it was dark and all about revenge and that women in tight black leather suits rampaging over rooftops trying to find like a kung fu movie which is how i'd done it um and they have the avengers you know and so i'm <laughs> i'm assuming at some point someone said we can have two scripts about a woman in a black leather suit going into an alice in wonderland world but we can't have two <laughs> so one of these is have to gonna have to change um so uh, I assume at some point someone would have said, oh, the Avengers, it's not a dark, crazy Alice in Wonderland revenge movie. It's a <laughs> spy spoof <laughs> right. or whatever they said. Um, and slowly you got uh, things which, uh, as I say, the Dr. Peel uh, revenge story went, these scenes in... Um, uh, started to disappear. Um, I said, why, why should that go? You know, that's really, you know, whatever. Um, you're very naive at that point. And I said, oh, you, you don't, just don't think it's working. Anyway, um, uh, it happens a lot, by the way. It's not like they picked mm -hmm. on mine, mm -hmm. but basically um, uh, ideas travel uh, in LA, in Hollywood. They travel within studios and they travel amongst competing producers. So if someone, I didn't realize this until um, I started doctoring scripts, you know, rewriting scripts. And um, I rewrote the, uh, one of the first Godzilla remakes, which ended up being done by uh, Old Emmerich. And at that point in the Godzilla movie script, there was an entire sequence set underground with a, you know, a tunnel and a flood and all this kind of stuff. Nothing to do with Godzilla or the people. And I said, well, that's got to go. 
You know, it's like nothing to do with it. Uh, and it wasn't until later I realized they, the writers, whoever, uh, had taken that scene from a different movie, a whole different movie, like a Sly Stallone movie, and yeah. they put it in <laughs> the Godzilla movie. Um, so that's by no means uncommon, but obviously as a, as a relative uh, naive, um, uh, also uh, I had a terrific agent um, at that time who represented a lot of very good writers and directors. Uh, and it would come across, I'd, I'd come across a lot of pressure uh, to change the characters to being Americans. And I said, well, there's no point in doing it American. How would you, it just wouldn't work from day one. It makes absolutely no sense in America. And said, oh yeah, but it'd be really great. There could be like spy people and like doing, th-. anyway, I, it made no sense to me. Um, but uh, my agent represented um, uh, a guy, J.J. Abrams. And um, lo and behold, like 18 months later, we get uh, Alias, right. uh, the TV episode, which is basically Emma Peel in America. <laughs> uh, you don't have to look too closely to, to see where that comes from. No. So, um, so anyway, while, while my script was lying around unmade, a lot of people took chunks out of it. Right. Uh, but in the evolution, yeah, it definitely went from um, uh, this sort of dark uh, revenge uh, uh, thing with like Georges Franju and Mario Bava and uh, a touch of Zen uh, Kung Fu uh, films. It, it, it metamorphosed, let us say. Right. Um, well, the script was still pretty good by the time they were doing it. Uh, a lot. It was all at night and. Um, uh, a lot of the plot uh, centered around uh, a good M appeal and a bad M appeal. Because for my money, the uh, the interest in anything went out when M appeal wasn't on the screen. So I thought, well, what would be the only thing better than one M appeal? And the answer was two. So I made a plot with two M appeals. So oh, yeah. anyway, it was I just to say it was all set at night, and they. You know, be swishing around in the night and did you see her, did you not see her, like a Mario Bava film or a Judex and everything. And then on the production, they came and said, oh, by the way, we, we're not doing any night scenes. You go, oh, <laughs> doesn't that take the entire <laughs> point <laughs> away? Um, anyway, there were, uh, it was a uh, process and an evolution uh, which more than once I uh, handed in my notice and left. Uh, but I was persuaded by um, those I thought with more sense and less um, uh, high-spirited uh, uh, defense of the motives for, high, for defending the script that I should carry on. And um, because these these things can last quite a long while, you know. Um, oh, for sure. So, uh, um, it's, uh, Anyway, so it did evolve, as they say. Um, but the script that, that Jeremiah shot from was a very good script. He did a terrific job um, uh, in the movie. Uh, there's a trailer uh, of the movie, which uh, I remember I saw in a theatre with Jeremiah, in fact, very early on, like nine months before the thing is going to be released. And, you know, we shot this fucking mm-hmm. thing, you know, and we looked at the trailer and we thought, Wow, that looks pretty good. <laughs> it's, it's what hooked me on the film. I saw it as a kid in the cinema. I was Same. like, I've got to see this. I've got to see yeah, this. You saw the trailer. I, saw, I don't think any of that appears in the film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I have a question about the evolution because, yes. um, you know, you talked about how, you know, Jeremiah brought in Sean Connery. And in the original script, De Winter is a fairly small part of the overall story, whereas Valentine Peel plays a much larger role was there maybe an yeah. attempt at a certain point just to kind of combine those two characters into one? How did that happen? <laughs> uh, I can tell you uh, very simply how it happened. Uh, the first script was basically um, Peter Peel's brother, Valentine Peel, had killed Peter Peel because he, he was obsessed with Emma, uh, his brother's wife. Uh, Valentine Peel had been at school with John Steed 
and they had appeared in a school production of The Tempest with <laughs> Valentine Peel playing Prospero. Mm -hmm. uh, all through Valentine's life, he never got the girl, he never got this, he never got that. So everything, <laughs> everything in Valentine's world, like the teddy bears and the childhood taunting, the games, everything was, re was reliving this childhood, you know, um, the, the sort of ruined world of childhood of, of his brother, which is why he hmm. killed. This makes so much more sense. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm having clarity. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, it's all coming together. <laughs> my, yes. My, my script was pretty clear. Uh, yeah. From Emma's point of view, it's um, uh, my husband died. I've gone nuts. But I have to come back now to clear my name. It's not bad enough that I'm still in grief. But I'm going to have to find the motherfucker who killed him just to clear my name. John Steed's thing was, wow, look at this. This is you know, this woman's very hot to handle. She's obviously in grief. She's slightly nuts. She's incredibly daring. Um, and my justification for Emma Peel's action, you know, her action here mm -hmm. was that she had a kind of death drive. She didn't care if she lived or died. What was important for her was to find out who killed her husband. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the revelation of um, Valentine Peel, the brother, was a tricksy, um, uh, you know, three, he pretended to be three people, I think. <laughs> uh, and then it eventually is revealed to be um, Valentine, the, uh, the missing brother. Um, uh, basically, uh, I was told that this would not fly. <laughs> It's got to be one guy. Um, and at that point, I just said, well, uh, <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> not only am I not doing that, I can't do that and because it makes no sense. It's like yeah. doing Hamlet, but, you know, the dad's still alive. You know, if there's no ghost haunting Hamlet, he doesn't give a shit. He's kind of, everything's okay. He's a prince. Like, who cares, you know? Um, uh, anyway, they took out the prince. They took out. Uh, they took out the um, the ghost of uh, Hamlet's father. They took out the ghost of Peter Peel, uh, making uh, basically they took out what was, to my mind, all what we call uh, in screenwriting terms the A story. You know, which is what it's about. You know. Uh, I'm trying to find out who killed my husband and I'm going to go nuts until I find out. Yeah. Uh, Steed is going to uh, accompany her on this mission and is, tries to stop her killing herself. But if she is guilty of these crimes against her, he will have to kill her, which he doesn't want to do. You know, but, um, uh, but as I say, when you, when you go to like one villain, what we were left with was the uh, B story, which is the sort of science project the kind of attempt to rule the world um, thing. Um, and uh, obviously I, I wasn't so sure that that was a great way to go. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> uh, it made no sense to me. Uh, I said I can, eventually after refusing to write it, I came around to the fact, well, they'll just get someone else in to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not like you storm off and then you take your pages with you. You, you storm off and then someone else rewrites it. Um, so I decided to think, well, I could probably save, you know, 70, 80% of what makes it good, um, which I tried to do. And uh, to my amazement, they managed to get it going and uh, um, get it you know, into production. So was a, the script that went into production was a much simpler, but um, maybe more straightforward and more doable uh, script. I, I bowed to the idea that my version was a little too um, uh, high art, let us say. <laughs> right. Um, 
<clears throat> I had a list of questions, but learning all this sort of thrown me for a loop a little bit. I'm trying to trying to compose <laughs> myself. Uh, I mean, it, by the way, did, did, I, I would uh, I would be miss uh, selling both myself and Jeremiah's self if I didn't say that. Uh, in all honesty, I got on very well with Jeremiah, and he was, he had a job to do, which was to get my kind of crazy, nutty, dark script into production and out into the theatres. You know. So he, he had his own um, uh, mission, as it were. Um, and he convinced me that there, there was a lot that we could do that was really good. And um, I, I, I don't have a quarrel with him at all, but these things are very common. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, I, you know, to, my, <laughs> to my mind, it, it, uh, it was a, uh, you know, a shadow of the, you know, uh, what, it, uh, what, it, what it would have been. So it was much lighter. Um, uh, but it still made sense. <laughs> right. That's the key. That's the key. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, well, uh, one of the questions I had was uh, it jumps to mind. It sounds like from what I've read at the script you sent over and uh, the chat we've had that uh, Dr. Emma Peel was the main protagonist. Yes. She had the main story. Yes. Um, is that how you envisioned it? That it was Emma yes, Peel absolutely. and then yes. John Steed? Yes. To my mind, there's no interest in John Steed. There's nothing in the movie. Patrick McNee is fantastic, mm -hmm. but he's not a character. John right. Steed isn't a character. Uh, he doesn't develop. No. Um, Emma Peel doesn't really develop in the TV thing, but there's scope for development. Um, and what I was wanting to do, tried to do, did do, was have, which I think could have worked, you know, was that. Emma Peel was this black widow character, literally mm. dressing in black, a widow uh, crazed by grief. And John Steed and her were in a kind of game of uh, what they call courtly love, not courtly love, but courtly love, mm. which is a sort of medieval uh, romance um, whereby the knight uh, is a protective and um, shielding character for mm -hmm. a woman and uh because i had no um uh i didn't know enough about hollywood to um cut my cloth towards what they like to measure i just decided to make um appeal the heroine um and it would be fair to say that there was a lot of resistance to this uh in Warners and before and during and after the film <laughs> was made. Um, so you had within Warners, you had a lot of resistance to this high art, dark art film that they somehow have ended up trying to do. Um, and they've also got a lot of problems about a kick-ass woman taking the lead. In later years, I mean, the, the script of the Avengers and the movie of the Avengers suffered. Be, you know, at, it's quite well documented by Jeremiah and others what happened in the post-production of this thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I like to think, uh, perhaps with some uh, delusions, but I like to think after the Avengers, people read it, you know, everywhere, uh, the scripts. Uh, after that, uh, Quentin Tarantino got Uma Thurman to basically do the Avengers script as Kill Bill, which yeah. is, you know, her husband dies and she goes on a mad rampage to uh, find the killer with lots of Kung Fu <laughs> parts in it. Uh, there was uh, Alias, Jennifer Garner. Um, and then later on, much, much later on, there was, uh, you know, The Black Widow um, and a lot of Luc Besson movies and all that kind of stuff. So I think the script traveled, um, uh, the film didn't, you know, the film, uh, which was pretty good, you know, as I remember it, um, it was, uh, it was uh, you know, an interesting, very arty um, uh, confection. Mm -hmm. uh, still quite sinister, quite uh, paradoxical, um, when they started, uh, I mean, I'm skipping a lot here, but um, 
they basically try to, you know, the film is like uh, an LSD version of a spy story. You know, it's like the crazed bits out of the Ipcrest file and the Manchurian candidate going on for like 90 minutes. It's yeah. like someone trying to find their way back out of the rabbit hole, back out of the Queen of Hearts um, uh, courtroom. Uh, uh, and if you don't know why Alice is there, uh, the whole thing makes no sense. Um, but I think also what happened is um, I was, you know, you can imagine I couldn't have been happier having Ray Fiennes, uh, mm. uh, Uma Thurman, uh, you know, Zama Peel, Sean Connery, for goodness sake, uh, as the baddie, as the villain, you know, in, um, and he was great and tell you lots about him. Um, but the, what I hadn't realized was that like inside Warner's and in the, uh, the marketing department, they regarded the entire project as something they couldn't possibly sell to anybody. Yeah. Rafe, <laughs> Rafe who's like Lawrence Olivier of his generation, they regarded as an effete, um, <laughs> you know, uh, homosexual, you know. Mm. Uh, Uma, they were always very suspicious of. She's New York, she's not a really American, you know. Um, and my God, what's what's James Bond doing? Um, you know, in the, wearing makeup and stuff. You know, it was like a, it was like doing a. Uh, you know, I tried to do a sort of dark um, uh, European art movie, and uh, what they thought uh, it was was like a sort of camp, uh, queer, transgressive. <laughs> movie you know it was carry so, on spying or something like that yes yes yeah. and um uh i i couldn't i never could quite work out how they put you know something above 50 million dollars into this you know as you know warner brothers is not known for lack of control whatever else it's known for i can assure you that every single point in this process this script and uh, every decision that Jeremiah took, every casting decision, everything was uh, gone through uh, 50 million times. And I can also show you that to get a, a film script into even the, the prospect of getting a green light at Warner's is very, very difficult. It has to be pretty good uh, because what you don't realize when you're not in the game, uh, you know, as I hadn't been, is that you think, oh, you do a great movie, they want to make it, they make it. What you don't realize is that if you've done a movie that people happen to like, whether or not it's good or not, I mean, obviously I thought it was fantastic, but um, for this fantastic script, it's going to get $50 million or whatever. That's $50 million that's taken away from someone else. <laughs> sure. <laughs> So I'd never figured that, you know, uh, and I, I would say coming from uh, Britain and being outside the whole process, it was a revelation, let us say. Uh, and as Jeremiah said, the one thing all we all learn from it is you don't try to do a, uh, a big art movie for Warner Brothers, you know. No. Uh, specifically, well, this... it, it was done as a very kind of like, literally like a French movie, like Jean-Jacques Benix. Yeah. You know? Uh, Jeremiah Chechik being Canadian, that was, uh, you know, I, I think Jeremiah was the nearest they wanted to go to, to France, you know. <laughs> um, uh, but um, when they, they thought they wanted to do that, um, uh, they really, uh, nobody told the marketing department, nobody um, told, and uh, so it's um, uh, this sort of high end, like a few theaters in New York and LA, you know, college campus, uh, uh, a sort of a prestige movie for mm. Warner, which mm. wasn't, um, you know, Warner's wasn't that studio, you know, Bertie Harry, Lethal Weapon, Batman, you know, the Warner's marketing department was like stuffing a goose full of food. They make foie gras there. Mm. They stuff that goose full and then they release the movie and it, plays they get several thousand things this you know like a few theaters in wherever it is what happened was as i recall that um 
I got the news, they were thinking of releasing it in the summer. And I said, but they must be nuts. Like this is, <laughs> you know, like December, kind of October kind of movie when it's cold. Um, you know, you're not going to have this as a summer. I believe other movies had dropped out. So ours was the one they were left with. So it's, um, yeah, it got, it's another, it's basically safe to say that the experience of um, making the film was a lot more like Alice in Wonderland than the, uh, the script ever was. <laughs> right. Um, so I'm curious, you know, the studio went in and edited out countless amounts of footage. Yes. And yes. the final result was, um, I think, very confusing for a lot of film goers to keep track of. Yes. Now, yes. Have, have you watched that version of the movie? I saw it once. Okay. So I, I'm curious if, even though it's completely compromised at that state from what the original two-hour cut was, were there any parts of the movie that maybe people who go back and watch it should hone in on as, this was what the original vision was, like moments that you look at when you see it and say, that's the movie I was making. A lot of this isn't, but those are kind of the moments that matter. Huh. Um, long pause. Yeah. I'm not sure that there are, there are moments, certainly. Um, I always said to myself, like, man, if I can get Uma in a leather suit and Sean Connery in a teddy bear costume, my job's done. You know, that was my <laughs> attitude. You've peaked. So, You've peaked. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, that's, you know, willingly doing that, you know. And um, I have to say, you know, Ray Fiennes was fantastic um, all the way through. Um, Uma was fantastic. Uh, uh, and Sean Connery was a delight, you know, he was uh, full of vim and uh, brio and uh, loved the, um, this kind of crazed villain uh, uh, that we all were, you know, obviously super keen for him to uh, play. But um, I would have to say that, um, to be honest, I can't really remember my, it's, it's like having a, uh, a child who is, has a very bad accident and then is reassembled into mm -hmm. uh, there are bits you kind of recognize and um, uh, but the, the the process is so uh, to be honest so agonizing <laughs> and uh, uh, the best you have fond um, cherished memories of um, but uh, it, you know it, the story has it was just taken away you know yeah um, and um, the whole raison d'etre was was taken away, uh, and Mick Audsley, who was the editor, who I you know well, uh, uh, he was just under the cosh. You know, mm. um, they. Uh, I think the the cut was about two hours ten, two hours fifteen, with all the credits. So that would be about one hundred and thirty five minutes. It should have come down, but that would be I think like forty five fifty minutes longer than the cut that was sent out to the theaters. We've spoken with um, Jeremiah Cheshik about his part of actually directing and, and the process of then editing and releasing the film, yeah. the problems he encountered. Yeah. Um, I have sort of two main questions. Um, now, this episode is coming out on the 23rd anniversary of the film being released in cinemas. So the first question I have for you was, obviously, your script went through all this process. Were you still around when they were shooting? Were you still assisting with rewrites and things like that on set? Or had you, were you done by the point they were shooting the film? Uh, I, I was pretty much done. Uh, there were a few bits and, you know, bits and pieces, uh, but nothing much. What, what happened was, I mean, there were, I mean, I, I think even the script that was approved for filming, I think I had to cut out a, a third, like about a month, six weeks before production. Um, I mean, was, this is this is crazy stuff to know that this, this script went through all these these changes. But yeah, um, yeah. one thing we got from our chat with Jeremiah was yeah. that the atmosphere on set was yeah. a really positive one. Everyone really enjoyed making the film. It was just yeah. the late. It was just the yeah. hard, arduous process afterwards. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, absolutely, yes. And, was there any talk? Oh, go on. 
Go. Cool. I had a very good atmosphere. You mm -hmm. brought a, you know, kind of quite a difficult cast together. It was, um, we had uh, a terrific team. You know, Stuart Craig, the production designer, who went to do uh, Harry Potter, um, has done many, many things. Uh, Roger Pratt, terrific cinematographer. Anthony Powell, wonderful costume designer. Um, uh, we really had the A team working mm -hmm. on that, and. Uh, and it, it's fair to say, you know, you know, the director at that point is very much the captain of the ship. You know, he sets the course and he sets the, uh, uh, you know, how you sail. And Jeremiah did very, 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 very well. And, uh, you know, it's a difficult film to make um, under any conditions. Uh, and he managed to improvise and do all the things you have to do as a director to keep it on track. Um, what I would say is that uh, when he was directing, everyone knew the film we were making. Mm. Um, Patrick McNee, who'd written this special part for as someone invisible, you know, um, uh, you know, he he said the script was terrific and loved it. So I, I kind of don't, you know, I I, I don't have um, uh, fears of, you know, that. Um, it wasn't a good script, you know. Uh, if Patrick sure. Meade was it's good, then it's good. Uh, so it's um, making of it was everyone knew the movie that they were making. It was a big, um, uh, but sort of arty, cerebral action movie where everything was visual, everything was cinematic. Uh, Stuart Craig did some fantastic sets. Um, the whole thing was this dreamlike action movie in my mind you know mm. um and uh, a lot of the action sequences that jeremiah shot had that great um thing there's two or three sequences some of which are in the trailer some of which someone has reconstituted online which are terrific like from the i mean basically they cut out the first 15 minutes of the film that explains which, everything yeah, yeah. Explains yeah. Everything. <laughs> Well, the, the question I was sort of leading to with, with, with the, the atmosphere on set, um, was there any uh, discussions of a sequel at all? I know it might be premature at the time, but everyone seemed to have been enjoying it and on that end. But did anyone I talk think, to you about I that? Every, well, I think everyone thought that if it went well, there would definitely be a sequel because um, Rafe and Uma, you know, worked well together. There was a feeling that, this was a, a way to make a sort of um, uh, an arty um, action movie, but very mm. British. And um, obviously there's a lot of attractions to doing that. You know? um, I mean, really, this was a movie for the rest of the world, not for America. You know? Yeah. Movie for France, Germany, um, Britain, uh, Europe. Um, it was in New York and LA. It wasn't for the um, uh, red states in America. Uh, they didn't get that memo. So it was, uh, uh, dare I say, bludgeoned into fitting into a box. <laughs> I, think, I think bludgeons is the apt word. I think, I think yeah, that's exactly I mean, what was, happened it to it. Brutal. Hatcheted. No, nobody, um, I, I, you know, look, it, you have to be grown up about these things. Uh, we, you, it's not that you're sworn to silence or about Omata. There's no point in complaining about these things. You know, Warner Brothers uh, pays you. And they pay you very well. And uh, what they say, it doesn't get contradicted. They run it. Mm. That's it. If you don't, you're just fired. You don't even, yeah. you're not even fired. You're just off. You're away. You're, so you have to understand what the, the game is. Um, what I what I was uh, yeah, I was exhausted, and, and then uh, after you know the um, production, and then uh, I was a little bit in touch with Jeremiah as we were filming. I saw some rough cuts, which were great, you know. Uh, so when it went off for uh, previews, I, I we were still very very optimistic, you know. Uh, but obviously, when I heard what was happening, it was just a brutal brutal process. Mm. And um, uh, what I could not believe was that uh, I remember there were things in the press. I remember I was I was away on holiday in the summer, and I read in the press, oh, um, 
they're not showing the movie to people, uh, critics and everything. And um, uh, having been a film critic, you know, I knew a lot of the people who were writing this stuff. And I thought, well, that's strange. But they haven't, they haven't finished the film. You know, it's like, mm. uh, and they hadn't, certainly hadn't shown it to me, you know. So it wasn't finished till very, very late. And it was rushed out. But what I, what I feel, uh, sorry for Jeremiah, for a lot of the people who did very good work on that, you know, um, the actors, uh, all the technicians, the crew, everybody, there was a lot of very, very good work in there. They, for example, they wouldn't let Jeremiah do a director's cut. They wouldn't let him do a uh, director's commentary, um, let alone me, you know. Uh, they really pretended that uh, it wasn't uh, something they wanted to engage with at all. Um, so basically to let things like the Matrix breathe, this had to die. So that, you know, that's, it's a very ruthless game. You, you can't complain about it. That's, that's what it is. But obviously it's... Um, you know, it's not a way to run a railroad, as the, as they say. You know, um, uh, so it was a it was a missed opportunity. I feel very uh, sad uh, that it didn't get to it didn't get its chance to uh, to play before an audience. You know, uh, you know that's 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 show business, as they say. Um, I used to rationalize it as. Um, uh, you know, if, it, if this experience had only happened to me, that would be, uh, I would feel paranoid, but it's very common, as I'm sure you know. But I, I always think of it as um, they summon the great chefs of Europe to make a hamburger. You know, is that they trawl everywhere for new tastes, new sensations, new tones, new um, uh, sophistications of uh, movies. Uh, they get you know, uh, directors, stars. Uh, and in the end, what they just want, really want is just a burger. You know, so it would be a lot easier if they just said, we want you to make a burger. And you say, mm, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't eat burgers. <laughs> burgers aren't scary. Don't push yeah. any envelopes, do they? Yeah, yeah so they're, they're basically, they, they, we gave a piece of, uh, you know, filet mignon or steak tartare, which is not for everybody. Absolutely not for everybody. You know, you, you know that. Uh, but they they put it into a burger and it still tasted terrible. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know it, it's a uh, it's a um, you grow up after that. <laughs> um, well, I, I asked um, Jeremiah this question. I'd be curious on your insights, which is that at the time you're making this, a studio mm -hmm. does not care at all about fandom, about how authentic it is to the source material. That is very much not the case now. Do you think a movie like this would have a far better chance of reaching the screen in its original vision, you know, made in the modern day? The short answer is yes, I do. I think it would be a very different movie making experience. I, I'm not sure if um, <laughs> it would ever have got greenlit, I suppose, uh, because, uh, you know, these things go in cycles, as we know. Uh, but I think that. Um, uh, I mean, something that's happened recently, uh, I think Zack Snyder recut, is it Justice League or something? Mm -hmm. Yep. Because he regarded the version that had gone out as a, you know, a betrayal and everything. They did a recut of that. And um, a journalist recently did an article on the Avengers because he had this great intuition. He had this great hunch, which was, he thought, he looked at the Avengers and he thought, wow, this is fascinating, but it just doesn't make sense. Like, what, what happened here? And he found out a bit about what happened and maybe he spoke with Jeremiah and people. And then he, he realized, oh, this is like Brazil before Terry Gilliam recut it. <laughs> uh, and obviously, I don't think Jeremiah would say it's as good as Brazil or, you know, you, you can't say it's going to be like that. But it's definitely like that it it was quite a cream i'd worked with terry gilliam um uh, you know uh uh before doing the avengers script and everything and um uh you know, it was a big battle there jeremiah got steamrolled um yeah that's the short way of uh doing it he uh he was sent to director's jail um and that's very cruel um you know, it, uh, he did a very good job and uh, 
I'm not saying it, it would have been like Brazil, but it was certainly quirky, strange. Um, it had definitely had its own world, you know, and uh, bits of that are in the, the movie. Some of the sets are fantastic, you know, some of the, uh, but I would, even I couldn't think why people are dressed as teddy bears in a mm -hmm. movie. You know. uh, I love that, but, you know, um, the idea that the villain is um, doing a, uh, is acting out uh, his revenge fantasies from his childhood uh, in a sort of uh, LSD-ish uh, way uh, might make some kind of sense. I think you said it best, it just wasn't a hamburger. Yeah. Yes, it wasn't a hamburger. And they wanted a hamburger. They didn't even want a uh, hamburger with lots of spice on it. They wanted, um, they didn't want Thousand Island dressing. They didn't want, uh, you know, um, uh, blue cheese. They, uh, they just wanted a plain hamburger. So they, they really, um, you know, when that uh, happens to you, and it is something that happens to you, it's not something you instigate. You, you are just mm -hmm. defeated. <laughs> you have to recognize defeat. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, so a lot of people have been very courteous and good about the, because they know the script and uh, they know Jeremiah. Um, uh, you know, you, when a movie comes out, um, obviously everyone wants it to be a, a big hit. Um, and strangely, uh, it didn't make much money in the States. It got uh, panned effectively. Uh, but actually, strangely, it still made a lot more money now than a lot of current movies do. So it's, everything is relative. But um, I wish uh, Jeremiah had been able to do a director's cut. Um, I don't know where the footage is now, um, if there's even a chance of doing that. I know there was a campaign to do a director's cut. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not known for their um, touchy-feely, uh, sentimental uh, view on uh, things like director's cuts. So it would definitely be uphill. But I, I would, um, uh, I, it happened to Jeremiah, it happened to Ridley Scott with Blade Runner. It happened mm -hmm. to Terry Gilliam with Brazil. It happens to a lot of people. Um, Ridley Scott could fight back. Terry Gilliam could fight back. It was very difficult for Jeremiah to, to get a voice, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, we we spoke to Jeremiah about the same thing, and he said he would be on board. It's just that the the, the film is in a vault somewhere, and yes. uh, much as WB has, uh, sorry, Warner Brothers has done things like the Justice League uh, yes. Snyder cut, as it were. Um, it's just whether there'd be enough fandom there to support a, a yes. remake, a, a re envisioning of the Avengers. Yes. Um, and and just to say, you know, much as myself and Cam, when we spoke about the movie on the episode this week there were some things we weren't particularly flatter, flattering about because it, as a film, it was quite confusing at times and the way it was portrayed. Yeah. But knowing what went into making that film, it gives you a certain appreciation of what could have been. Yes. yes. And, and, and that's, I, I extended this to Jeremiah and I'll extend it to you as well. I think what was created to become the film was fantastic. I think it was a really great uh, story that you came up with. It's just a shame what the studio did. Now, I'm not paid by them, so I can say that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, exactly. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, you have to, you have to be grown up if you're a writer. You know, it's um, uh, it's not my uh, fifty million dollars. And that mm. they can do it's property of Warner Brothers, and there it is, um, uh, for better or for worse. Uh, you know, I, I I do think that there is an appetite for uh, seeing these things again uh, and thinking how they were intended. Um, whether that happens uh, ever, I don't know. But yeah, the the, the film that's there is, uh, you know, it's like a, a just a, a, a fragments, um, mm. offcuts, not even making as much sense as the trailer. Yeah. Um, you know, so the, the trailer has a sense of what it what it was like. You know, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I mean, th this happens a lot of times. Um, and uh you know it's tough <laughs> that's for sure but um uh you know if you if you read the original script uh, the script that went into production all these kind of things you you, you start to get a picture uh, i'm sure i was speaking from jeremiah you start to get a a feeling of uh what was intended and what was uh there to a large extent you know yeah right um now Don, before we wrap up, I did just want to touch on some more of your work, which is the Fleming TV yes. series. And of course, we are a spy movie podcast, so how could we not talk about Ian Fleming? Yes. Um, so just quickly run us through your involvement with that. Uh, 
this was with a British production company and uh, I was uh, involved at the beginning of the project and uh, I couldn't do it for whatever reason. I think I was busy or something. Uh, another writer did a uh, uh, episodes, uh, did a first draft. Uh, they got it towards production and uh, decided it didn't work. Um, I read the script very quickly and agreed that it didn't work. Um, and I worked with Matt Whitecross, the director, and we did uh, a version which we thought did work. Um, uh, Ian Fleming was um, uh, a very complicated guy. Um, he was uh, very, very British, very strange, very um, had a difficult relationship to reality and to fantasy all through his life. And obviously as the creator of Bond, um, there's uh, a lot of fascination in what his um, uh, real life was like and mm. what also that he said had happened in his real life, which is not always the same. Yeah. Um, so, no comment. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, he, uh, he was a fantasist, uh, mm. uh, but in some very um, real places. Um, and I think one of the pleasures, uh, I think um, the script, when I came in, I, I wasn't a fan of it. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to do in, you know, uh, three or four hours to do someone's life to get to the nub of it. Um, but I, when I came in, I said, uh, uh, I, I thought the, the script that was there was a bit like Biggles Goes to War, which I wasn't keen on. Uh, so I said I wanted to make it like Don Draper in Fifty Shades of Grey. You know, that was my <laughs> idea. Um, so you had someone like Don Draper, you had someone who wasn't really the person he pretended to be mm. uh, and that it was all wrapped up in this emotional life of, uh, well, literally sadomasochistic uh, fantasies that she had uh, with his various women mm -hmm. uh, and then with, especially with his wife. The combination of that fantasy, that wartime experience and particular should we say psychosexual <laughs> um, <clears throat> buzz that Fleming had gave birth to Bond in the post-war era, and um, the team that, was, that did the uh, project, Mike Whitecross, especially, uh, they, they did a terrific job. And uh, uh, again, that that was a very sweet experience as, as opposed to the Avengers. Uh, well, but, uh, I mean, Dominic Cooper was was great in that, actually. Yeah. As someone who has watched it. And I, I caught it on Sky Atlantic when it was out around the time, I think about six or seven years ago at this point now. But I'm not sure if it's available in the States at all. But I, I imagine it should it's be. It came out on BBC America. It got nominated ah. for awards, I think. Um, yeah, Dominic Cooper did a fantastic job. I think Tom Hiddleston was going to play it at one point. Yeah, that would have been different. Um, um, but the, the spy genre as it, uh, keeps on giving. Um, I like, you know, like the, the screenwriter's life is like an iceberg, you know, uh, nine tenths is invisible. But among the projects I've been involved in, uh, uh, I did a script for John Woo, uh, which was basically the third man, but set in Beijing. Okay. For yeah. uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and Tobey Maguire. Leonardo DiCaprio as the kind of Harry Lyme character and Tobey Maguire as the Joseph Cotton character. Oh, wow. Um, so uh, that sort of vanished into the Leonardo DiCaprio vault, <laughs> I think. Um, but that was, that was great. That John Woo, uh, obviously worked with him on a script is fantastic. Real understanding of filmmaking. Um, uh -huh. Just incredible uh, experience, uh, but the last didn't get made. <laughs> yeah, um, that, that so seems to be a, a running theme with the screenwriters we've spoken to so far. Is there's been yeah. good stuff I've done, but you've never seen it. Yeah. Yes, never yeah. seen it. Um, um, but, Terrence Malick, uh, you know, all, all these uh, films. Well, you, you've led us on beautifully to sort of the the final questions I always throw out to our guests, which is more about spy movies in general. Yes. Um, so my first question to you is. What is your favorite spy movie? I can answer that very easily, which is it is Goldfinger. Oh, For nice. A million uh, reasons. Um, like everyone, I'm a fan, especially of the first three on films, Dr. No mm -hmm. from Much Love and uh, Goldfinger. But Goldfinger brings um, 
there's a kind of a realism, a bravado, a confidence making in Connery, in the villains, in odd job, everything, uh, which is really at a high point. And um, uh, even when you know that the car chases were done around Pinewood Studios and everything, it's, um, uh, it's fantastic. What I've liked going into, I mean, I like, I found a list of all the movies that I saw in the land about that, those times. And I, I saw everything like the Crest File, Aquila Memorandum, the Silencers, In Light yeah. Flint, everything. So I would watch everything, but Goldfinger uh, remains the thing. Uh, and I should add, with honorable mention, more than honorable mention, all the Hitchcock spy movies, mm-hmm. and including, um, although it's not technically a spy movie, North by Northwest, which I think gives the kind of blueprint for mm-hmm. kind of modern storytelling of a spy movie. The, the combination of action and reaction in that is just fantastic. It's um, a phenomenal it's, film. It's, it's probably my choice of favorite spy movie apart from a Bond film. Right, yeah. I mean, it's a, so, you know, I, I could, you know, talk for a, a long while of that. I, I have a soft spot for the European spot, you know, Danger Diabolique, uh, uh, this is much more surreal um, uh, thing. I have a soft spot for that. Um, uh, you know, I like the, uh, obviously I love the Ipcrest file and everything. Uh, uh, the, the thing of what I was going to say and in, in regards with the Avengers as well is that um, the Avengers, I think what, what they managed to do was they went beyond the sort of spy thing. You know, when Danger Man went into the prisoner, they, uh, they did a lot of things that the Avengers was doing and they picked up on a lot of the, the British spy novel and movie is has a lot of other genres inside it. It's sort of mm-hmm. quite a gothic thing, quite a horror thing. Um, you know, I think even Tinker Tailor's Soldier Spy is a little bit Agatha Christie and a little bit uh, fear of all these doubles inside this room. Um, there's a sort of uh, there's a lot of different things that go into a really good spy film. Um, the best ones really uh, managed to combine quite a few different um, things. But but Goldfinger to me has, uh, uh, it just has such a sort of confidence. And Ken Adams' work in that is just terrific. The sets yeah. are just phenomenal. I actually went, I mean, I'm someone who, I went to the Fontainebleau Hotel in Miami Beach, you know, which is where the Bond sequence is played uh, to uh, i won't say to reenact that uh, that's, that's a humble brag right there I think. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh, you know i was always fascinated by that so um uh, but hitchcock and uh, it seemed like those early bond directors you know terence young guy hamilton who'd been assistant director guy hamilton i saw in the credits was assistant director on the third man you know so there's a lot of these mm-hmm. um the confidence that a lot of these guys had, uh, and they were guys, that's for sure, the confidence that they had at movie making really hit a peak in things like The Third Man, uh, Goldfinger. Uh, I saw The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, uh, which is, I think, a Martin Ritt film. And although it isn't um, up there with the, the greats, it's, um, uh, again, it's terrific as a... Um, uh, uh, it's a counterpoint to the Bond extravaganzas. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, do you expect me to talk Goldfinger? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, it's just fantastic. Um, it's, uh, and it, it's why the, you know, like the, the spy genre coming out of, you know, the Cold War, the war and the Cold War and um, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Philby, uh, James Jesus Angleton, all these things. The good spy stories have something else going on. The sort of fear, paranoia, secrecy, uh, the gothic sort of fear of the double, um, fear of the traitor, you know, that um, thing. Um, uh, so I think, as I say, in, all, in, in my way, I was trying to channel all these things uh, uh, into my own scripts, and obviously it's uh, it's a, a difficult step <laughs> to go from uh, one thing to another. But um, you know, you uh, uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Well, sure. at least there wasn't any uh, laser beams cutting bun- uh, sorry teddy bears in half in Avengers. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm sworn to secrecy. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> well, that leads me on to the next question, really. And I think you may have answered it already, but who is your Bond? Oh, well, Sean Connery. Yeah. Yeah, it's no, uh, no one else for me. Um, not even in debate. <laughs> um, I like some of the other films there. Uh, I don't know um, uh, Rob and Neil who write the current ones. And um, mm. uh, I was supposed to uh, audition for the Bond, um, you know, as a writer for the Bond things. But you had to do like, come up with like four great ideas, you know, uh, Bond ideas. And uh, I remember thinking, I'm not coming up with like four <laughs> great Bond ideas. If I could come up with one, if I got the gig, that would be fine. But um, so I always tease uh, Rob and Neil, uh, who write the Bond films very, very successfully, that, um, uh, you know, I, uh, I let them uh, take the gig and, uh, um, you know, uh, They've done super well at it, so I'm very happy for them. Although I would sure. like that DVD royalties, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding, who wouldn't, right? <laughs> uh. um, <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll propose a new question then. Yes. As you are a writer yourself, yeah. if, if someone who owns an IP was to drop it on your lap today and say, I want a script of this particular protagonist, so a Bond, huh. a Harry Palmer, uh, anyone you want, Pick a franchise and you have to write the next film. What would be the, the character you pick? Who would you want to run with? Well, I, I, personally, I, I would redo all the Bond films. Ooh, the redo? Bond. Yes. Mm. If I was, Start from uh, scratch. Casino Royale? Yeah. Well, they did Casino Royale. That was, you know, that, that was something they hadn't done. And I think that was very successful. Because that's one of Robin Neal's best uh, things. Uh, but I think, like Doctor No, all, all these things, mm. there's things you find in the books that um, uh, that are terrific. Uh, and he, he's uh, a nutty writer. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to read them without the movie Bond interfering. But the Fleming Bond mm. is crazy, you know. It's um, uh, so I think there's definitely a way of doing those which are not stuck in the early sixties, you know. Um, oh, so you would bring them to a modern time? Well, no, no, but the, the style. Uh, ah, like, yeah. Because the world of sexuality and, uh, you know, Connery um, embodies a lot of the qualities Fleming didn't know he wanted in a screen bond. Mm. Um, he's very existential. He, uh, uh, he's, he uh, thinks before he acts very swiftly, but he's very... Um, uh, he, he moves well, uh, Connery. It's, um, uh, yeah, I mean, he was he, even, he, uh, I'll another time, he talked a lot about making uh, the James Bond movies, you know, which obviously it was a great, great fun, uh, to hear and, uh, uh, he, with some affection, uh, as he would reminisce about Ursula and, and uh, <laughs> other people uh, involved in those adventures uh, but um i don't have a um a kind of a uh you know they 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 have redone or are redoing pretty much everything uh, mm -hmm. sherlock holmes to uh dracula to um the le carre movies um uh you know it, it's it's difficult to find anyone that they haven't uh uh, redone. So uh, I would have to have a think about that. But I, I think you could definitely redo the Bond uh, films. Well, uh, I mean, who knows? Maybe yeah, the Ave maybe the well, Avengers will get another round. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I've, that one's probably. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I could. I wouldn't hold my breath on that one. No, I mean, it's very, it's uh, very, very sad. It's very sad, and uh, a lot of people did a lot of very, very good work. Uh, it's not evident what's. Uh, on uh, on in the film on the DVD there that you uh, watch, but um, uh, it um, uh, you know you can't tell people oh but there was a great script but there was a very good script and Jamai mm -hmm. did a very good film out of it so um, what happens um, after that is uh, you know it's working with Warners is um, difficult you know right <laughs> well I think that uh, that wraps up our discussion. 
uh, on Avengers uh, today. But I, I do want to thank you, Don, for joining us, of course. I know you've, you've taken a, a good chunk of your day out to chat to us about this film, a 23-year-old film. So thank you for that. Is, yeah. um, is there anything you want to tell the listeners that you're up to at the moment? What is it you're working on right now? Uh, I'm doing a TV series based on an H.G. Wells story, The Sleeper. Oh, okay. About a man who's been uh, asleep for many years. And while he has been asleep, he has become the richest man in the world. Oh. And, uh, so this is a hmm. very modern take. The, the, the novel is 110, 120 years old. Uh, this is a very modern take on this. Um, and it's a sort of mystery science fiction thing set in a future London. Uh, so I'm very keen on that. Um, and uh, I'm also doing another story about a um, uh, kind of third manish kind of story, but about a, an old spy, a sort of Bond-like spy who's in retirement and is summoned to Istanbul to meet his son. Uh, who has just been killed in an accident and uh, mayhem ensues, let us say. So uh, a conflict between uh, someone who is out of the game and uh, his son who he didn't even know was in the game. So uh, there's a lot of um, uh, these uh, kind of things still whirl around, you know. Oh, it sounds like we'll be having you back on in a couple of years' time to talk about this film then. <laughs> yeah. Um, all, I, all I need is about uh, 30 million. So uh, <laughs> I've, I've got about 10 quid. Does that help? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I'll certainly take it. <laughs> <laughs> the listeners can all club to it. We'll leave a, um, a sort of PayPal account at the end of the podcast. And, uh, all sort of Go fund me, Paige. It's very, it would be very uh, not done to give anything less than a thousand dollars or a thousand pounds. So, uh, <laughs> after that, it's up to uh, whatever anyone wants. To well, do. we'll start a fund for the Avengers uh, director's cut. Yeah, that's as well. That's, uh, yeah, you know, I, think, I think it's knocking against a very closed door, but um, I, you know, I, um, uh, it's you'd like to think that uh, they would want to. Um, let something which they made, which they put a lot of money into, to let it be seen um, finally um, in it, in all its glory, um, and let people decide. You know, people sure, are growing up now, and uh, there's a whole story about the film, which I think adds to its uh, uh, thing. It's not a, a piece of entertainment that would be consumed. You know, the movie theaters, as we know, are not even open, but it it has a um, it was an ambitious, uh, wild, and crazy, uh, uh, you know, epic, and uh, it's still out there in a vault somewhere. So, uh, to my mind, it hasn't uh, been released yet. So I'm um, <laughs> still waiting for it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Don, again, thank you for joining us. We appreciate yeah, your time. It's a pleasure. And uh, you know, obviously, if it's uh, if the strapline is that it's the uh, Brazil of the '90s, I'd be very happy with that. This was this was really interesting, like a guided tour through '90s studio filmmaking. So I very much enjoyed this. Thanks so yeah, much. So it's a, it's a, it's a. I'm not sure if it's a chamber of horrors or a uh, <laughs> universal tour. It's, there's a few, um, uh, yeah, there's a few um, OK Corral and sort of Tombstone <laughs> uh, kind of things like that. But Jerry Jerry Weintraub, who made it, was uh, uh, should we say a, a tower of strength and. Uh, <laughs> He had been through many, many things. And uh, in Hollywood, when something like this happens, um, uh, anyone uh, who's been through it, uh, they don't fling things at you. They just say, welcome to the club. <laughs> awesome. There you have it, folks. That was our chat with Don McPherson telling us all about, well, what could have been with the story. Uh, and, you know, we had the pleasure of, of going through the original script uh, with him. And, you know, it's a very different story. Oh, yeah. I remember being really surprised up front that the Sean Connery character, um, who I believe has the name Merriweather um, in the original screenplay, I believe, I believe um, you know, was renamed to August de Winter. Um, boy, like he wasn't even the main villain. There's so much to delve into there and how much this movie was also envisioned very much as an Emma Peel exploration as opposed to more of this kind of jovial two-hander as we wound up with in the final film. You could say the studio didn't find the uh, original version very 
appealing. Mm, you could, but you really shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't make puns. I shouldn't make puns. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, it was just a, a complete departure from what we got on the screen. And uh, you know, again, it was a fascinating insight into well screenwriting in Hollywood, really, and just you know the conception of a story. And then it going through the process of being developed into a film. And, you know, um, Don was involved pretty much all the way through um, and had to make several changes to his story that I think by the end just muddied the vision. I, you know, I love the idea of there being this, like, of Emma Peel being the lead. I think that's more interesting. Sorry, Ray Fiennes fans out there. I also very much appreciated explanation as to the giant teddy bears that occupy much of this movie because i remember sitting in the theater and being like what is going on with this movie and you could watch it now and have the same takeaway because it seems incoherent but when you hear don talk about the original vision of the villain um and how the teddy bears thing tied into it him trying to relive his childhood it's like oh this all makes sense. Like I understand what he's going for. And I really enjoyed how he took us through the original story, the original focus of the film and showed how all of these changes along the road that were made throughout production completely undid the elements that were baked in thematically throughout originally. Like it makes them feel like these bizarre non sequiturs when originally they made a lot more sense and actually probably would have, um, done a better job enriching the world of the Avengers versus actually seeming like they're constantly interfering with something. And, uh, you know, if we're talking about the conception of the story, also the conception of the film was something we explored in the interview, talking about like the different directors that were involved before Jeremiah took over. You know, David Fincher hmm. was in the picture. That's That's a different film. Because that was how the film was originally pitched, as he described. It was never meant to be this big summer blockbuster. It was meant to be this kind of quirky British film. Yeah. Um, which, the, which the original script reads like. And I think the original cut, the longer cut, probably plays more like that too, just with a bigger budget. Uh, I mean, I still want to find that uh, David Fincher Honda advert that he filmed for Avengers before he you know, left the project. That's out there somewhere. Um, but yeah, that's, that's fascinating how it just went through all these evolutions. Yeah. And just how, you know, the original vision of the story just did not make it across the finish line. And I, you know, I very much appreciate him talking about how this was not intended to be a summer blockbuster. This was supposed to be a mid budget quirky adventure film that, you know, would probably be more of something aimed at a specific audience versus everyone. Like the thing is with the cost and the, you know, release date for this version of the Avengers, the 1998 film, it had to please everybody. And it was a property not really meant to please everybody. And a project that was intended to be very much kind of um, aimed at, shall we say, maybe like a geekier audience, like an audience that's really into something idiosyncratic, something quirky from their genre films. And the summer movie audiences are not those people. No, I mean, he he clearly envisioned it as more of the, you know, the Lacares, the Daytons out there, that more sophisticated spy story. I just have an image in my head of, of Harry Palmer being chased by bees uh, that I can't shake out of my head. I think that would have <laughs> been a great follow-up. Maybe they would have had that on the Horse Under Water if they ever made it. Mm. But, um, yeah, you could tell that both, and you know, this connects to the original interview, but Don and Jeremiah were both big fans of the original show, you know, Patrick McNee, Dinah Rigg. Um, and they both tried to stay true to the weirdness that is the Avengers and that sort of quaint British feeling. And I think it was just sort of swallowed up by the blockbuster machine that is Hollywood. Um yeah, but again, just you know, going through some of these evolutions of like having four different peels in the character, I think in total, mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah, uh, I'm, maybe that maybe that was cut for a reason. Maybe that would have confused audiences. I understand that, um, but even in the version we get at the end, they shot plenty of scenes with two Emma peels, and then we never really see most of it. 
Yeah, it's a very confusing final version of what originally was a very specific quirky film. Um, I also just really appreciate any chance we get to just talk through the process of writing one of these movies because it feels so personal when you hear Don talk about it, about what he wanted to achieve. And it's too bad it didn't happen, but it, not an uncommon story with the Hollywood screenwriters. It, yeah, I was just thinking about this. You know, can you imagine if someone say they came up to me and you and said, "Right, everyone knows we're big fans of Star Trek, apart from you know spy movies, of course." And they said, "Cam and Scott, we want you to write the next Star Trek film." Yeah, and we are like, "Ah, oh, we've got this," and we think we've knocked it out of the park. We we spend a year pouring our heart into the continuing adventures of you know, the USS whatever, and then the studio gets it and tears it to shreds, and then the public blames us for it. Mm, yep that's that's the curse of the screenwriter and the director is that sometimes things are taken out of their hands and butchered and uh you know the public or critics who do, who do they point the finger at right like it tends to be the people behind the scenes that made the film whereas so many circumstances can corrupt that vision um yeah i mean you know these these suits and offices are all sort of faceless well suits so they don't you're right they don't get the blame um, and again, uh, you know, uh, slight off topic segue, I suppose, but like quantum of solace is a film that's being reapprised recently mm-hmm. and people are saying it's not so bad. Now I'm not joining that camp personally. Uh, I don't really have much of an opinion, uh, but my, the reason I raise this is because, you know, us diving into this film is not some sort of way of saying oh you know avengers is actually a really misunderstood film and it's actually a you know yeah a really interesting film when you dig into it i'm not saying that the the delivered product wasn't good but what's fascinating is knowing what the creative people came up with and what could have been and that's what i've loved about having these two chats with you know jeremiah and don is the passion that they put into these projects and you know in some parallel universe we could have had an Avengers franchise because it was just so good. And that's one thing I think we've tried to do with the spy master interviews is that we want to bring on people who also worked on movies we didn't care for um, because we want to learn more about what was going on behind the scenes. How did these films happen? Because we could easily sit down and talk about the Avengers, do a 90 minute episode, tear it to shreds and be like, well, there you go. But it makes it a more interesting journey. I think if we have our say, And then we let the people who made the movie come on and say, here's what I wanted to do and here's why it didn't work. And suddenly we go, oh, well, that's a whole other conversation now because between, you know, both the director and the writer, I don't know that there's many people that have done more work in terms of getting the narrative of the creation of the Avengers film to the world. Like for some reason, that's become our niche out of, uh, I guess just happenstance. It wasn't something we aspired to when we began this podcast, but we're very happy to be able to do it. And um, I would like people to have that takeaway of, oh, like maybe the movie I don't like, there's more complexities behind that story than just, well, they all screwed it up. Who knows? You know what I mean? Well, I think that's a a lesson for the modern times. Dig a little deeper. Hmm. You know, find out how that sausage was made. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I think this was a good time. Obviously, this is the 23rd anniversary that this film came out. Uh, and it, it sort of spurred us on to cover the film. It's also our one year anniversary. So it all sort of, you know, coincided at the same time. And, you know, some people will do like their favorite film on their one year anniversary or a really popular film. The Avengers isn't either of those things. But what it is, is an interesting study into the failings of Hollywood to utilize the talent of its people. You know, you can tell that Don McPherson had a really interesting story to tell and he was able to adapt it from the very interesting but maybe hard to understand story that he had in the beginning to a a more easy to grasp blockbuster film that he had by the end but he did craft that and it was you know the two hour version from all intents and purposes is a lot better and then jeremiah you know took up that mantle and delivered a film from what it seems to be was a 
perfectly pleasant set. Everyone was enjoying themselves and there was no dramas. So what failed was at the end and that was in edit and that was in politics. And so I think I'm, I'm glad we got the opportunity to delve into this film, maybe give it its, uh, its retrospective. I know it's not its 25th anniversary, but hopefully we've, uh, you know, we, we've created a definitive Avengers collection. <laughs> and if you're listening to this in the year 2023, you can celebrate the 25th anniversary with this uh, series of interviews. Yeah, let us know if you've uh, if you if you're enjoying this in the year 2023. I'm sure I'll still be tweeting. Hmm. But again, we want to thank Don for taking the time to sit down with us and join us in our one year celebration, talking about 1998's Avengers, 23 years after the fact that it came out. Uh, Cam, what have we got coming up next week? We have a very special episode. We are going to hold our first James Bond roundtable. This time, we are going to talk about the Brosnan era. What were its strengths? What were its minuses? Who were the best villains? We're going to talk all about it with a, I think, really interesting panel of guests. And we are going to break down the Pierce Brosnan, James Bond era. Yeah, this is a, a an idea I kind of concocted. I I kind of want to, when we finish an era, like you say, so the Brosnans in this case, I kind of want to sit down and really collectively analyze them as a series of films. And we'll do the same for, you know, Connery's, Craig's, Moore's, all going down the line. The Lazenby one, we'll, maybe we'll uh, bunch that in with David Niven. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've got a, a couple of great panelists uh, that, coming, that come at it from different angles, I would say, as well. And I think a couple of our previous Brosnan guests might be stopping by to say hello as well. Very good. Very good. Uh, that's right. So join us next week as we celebrate the Pierce Brosnan Bond films in style, in tuxedos, drinking martinis. Uh, you can, of course, follow us on social media discreetly at spyhards that's s-p-y-h-a-r-d-s on facebook twitter and instagram but until next week listeners good luck in an office full of teddy bears